sugar daddy. Mm, 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 she sure looked good. Kathy John was about 25 when I was 16. That was about 1962. Kathy was spoken for twice. I'll explain later. Kathy was the wife of 80-year-old Wilbur John, a coal and land baron who lived about 12 miles out of town. Kathy wanted for nothing. She had the nicest and tightest clothing that money could buy, and I must say that she filled out the pricey items in a most splendid fashion. She was about five foot four, slender build, and had tits like county fair prize cantaloupes, and an ass tighter than the lug nuts on a semi. She always sported around in a brand new red T-Bird convertible. I'd see her cruising by in the summer with her chemically altered blonde hair waving in the air. Her eyes, hidden behind expensive sunglasses, looking forward, acknowledging no one, and possessing a sardonic grin like a Beverly Hills bitch. To all the boys in town, she was a turn-on. Just about all knew her story. Kathy started warming up to the old man about three years ago. She used to be a waitress at the New Creek Diner. From the get-go, she called him Sugar Daddy. The old man used to eat breakfast at the diner about every morning. That was shortly after his age-appropriate wife passed away several years ago. And just about all the restaurant, all in the restaurant used to comment that Sugar Daddy would peel off a 50 for his breakfast and leave a big tip for Kathy. Kathy wasted no time. About a year ago, the old man forgot his glasses at the diner, and Kathy returned them to him. The rest is history. Before you knew it, the two were married, and Kathy, w Kathy was in the money for the first time in her life. Wilbur John was about 79 when he got married again. He was about Kathy's height, but uh, that's where the similarity ended. He was so damn fat that most of the time you couldn't tell whether he was walking or rolling. In the summer, his face turned a bright magenta under the Appalachian sun. His wire-rimmed glasses had developed patina from his cigar. He was a chain smoker. We used to laugh about old man John in town. Howie down at the gas station said that he could get it up. The only problem was that he couldn't remember where it was. Cattle, coal royalty, shit. They took half of his property for the dam. Hell, he wasn't hurting. Kathy took full advantage of his wealth. She used to shop in Cumberland a lot. I was up at the farm place uh, delivering packages from a local store. There he was on the front porch with a glass of whiskey. He's wearing that blue plantation suit, complete with bow tie like he used to do. Kathy came out and milked out several hundred dollar bills out of him for a trip she was taking. It looked like she was taking candy from a baby. Oh, sugar daddy, honey, I need some money for a new dress. She stroked his chins as he sat on his old rocker on the porch. He pulled out a wad of bills out of his pocket that would choke a horse and peeled a few off for his lovely wife. She exited to her T-bird and was gone in a flash. The couple's dwelling happened to be the old family farmhouse about ten miles out of town. Kathy had even expanded the back to include a swimming pool. She also bought this nice furniture and even a pool table. Hell, if you'd seen the place before Kathy, you wouldn't have known the place. There was a handyman, Jim, who lived in a small shack nearby. Jim was 25 and lean and strong and handsome. Needless to say, Jim and Kathy were real good friends. Just about everybody in town suspected they were bumping uglies. Sugar Daddy suspected it, too. However, they were discreet. It would be a while before the truth was known. Bob Pugh, one of the other farmhands, used to get supplies for Sugar Daddy at the store. I was often in there and the bullshit would fly. The slender 50-year-old farmhand used to talk of how Kathy would sunbathe nude by the pool in the backyard, how he once saw Jim bring her iced tea. Then he would laugh. You couldn't get much more from Ugly Bob, but you could sort of fill in the blanks yourself. Several of the other farmhands lived in a bunkhouse by the barn. On the days that the cattle were transported to Moorfield, Sugar Daddy would go along with the farmhands. I guess he was always looking out to get a good price for his animate merchandise. With everybody gone, Jim and Kathy would get it on. But one day, Sugar Daddy came back early from an outing. Jim barely had enough time to get out of the win back window before the old man came in the house. Sugar Daddy noticed that the bedsheets were a mess. Suspicion ensued after that. Which brings me to the time that Sugar Daddy bought one of those time-lapse cameras and hid it in the bedroom. He disguised the camera in a large book on the bookshelf directly in front of the bed. He figured it was a good spot since Kathy never read anything serious. Kathy was into those cheap confession magazines. Then one day Sugar Daddy took off with this fellow for a cattle sale. People said that he left about eight in the morning, spent all day at Moorfield. He must have felt generous. He treated uh, his help to both at lunch and dinner over there. They got back about 8 p.m. The next morning, as Kathy took her shower, Daddy retrieved the film. After breakfast, he had Jim drive him down to the photo shop in Kaiser. He even waited around until the prints were made. His worst fears were confirmed. 
He reviewed the pictures right there at the photo shop while Jim waited in the car outside. He even gave the photo shop operator $50 to keep his mouth shut. The 50 was on top of the price of the speedy film developing. With the pictures neatly tucked in his suit coat pocket, he got in the passenger side of the car parked outside. Did you get the photos? Yep. What are they about? Jim, it's just some pictures of some property that I'm looking after. All said Jim, uninformed and unalarmed. The drive was uneventful back to the farm. The very next day, Sugar Daddy invited Jim in for a nip of whiskey. On that particular day, Kathy was off spending money shopping. Jim relished the drink in Daddy's living room without a care. What Jim didn't know was the whiskey was drugged. He was out in a couple minutes. When Jim woke up, he was in the basement tied to a chair. About five feet in front of him was a table, and on the table a candle. Not just an ordinary candle, but one with a thirty-eight embedded in it. That's right, about halfway down the wax of this huge candle was a cocked thirty-eight, with the barrel pointed at Jim's head. Sugar Daddy sat in a folding chair nearby. He spoke. You know, Jim, the longer something lasts, the better it is. Right, Jim? And, Jim, you should know about that kind of stuff. Jim was terrified and at a loss for words. Sugar Daddy lit his cigar and then lit the candle. All good things take time. With that, Sugar Daddy walked out of the basement, ensuring that the door was closed and locked. Sugar Daddy was of the mindset so popular in those pre-litigation days. Most people felt that they didn't need no lawyers to settle disputes. It was about 6 p.m. Jim tried to calm down. Perhaps if he could get out of the ropes, he could escape. He tried to loosen the ropes. As soon as he tried, he received an electrical shock. He looked down at his legs. Wires were attached to both legs. The ropes behind him had fishing line attached to a metal plate overhead. Any movement of the fishing line closed the contacts on a metal plate, which then caused the shock. The only way not to receive a shock was to sit completely still. Several times his body moved enough to set off the shock. He had to stay especially alert not to move. He was in a state of confusion. His mind moved from the threat of the occasional electrical shock to the possibility of a permanent mortal damage. It was just not a good day for Jim. Perspiration grew into tiny beads on Jim's forehead. His heart went thump, thump, thump. He could actually hear his heart. And any, I mean any, movement caused an electrical shock. Jim's mind raced for ways to get out of the fix. For a while he tried to spit on the flame and put it out. It was useless. The one time the spit was on target, the flame went out. Then slowly the flame reignited. Sugar Daddy had thought of everything. The candle wick was made out of that material they use in novelty birthday candles, the ones you can't blow out. It seemed like a lifetime, but at 7.05 the candle started burning faster and faster. It no longer seemed to be wax, but something like paper. A four-inch flame enveloped the entire six-by-six six candle. Jim's perspiration continued to drip to the floor. His heart was racing at that time. At 7.06 the trigger came down. Out of the barrel of the gun came a stick with a flag. Bang was written on the flag. Sugar Daddy came back to the basement. His entire short, fat body shook with laughter. He untied Jim and told him never to come back. Jim needed no more encouragement to break up the association. They say that old cars couldn't do zero to sixty in ten seconds. Jim's car was close to the speed record that day as he sped away from Sugar Daddy's place. And Kathy never came back. The folks around town said that Jim saw her driving in as he made his exit. They both took off immediately. Kathy didn't even go back to the house to get her clothing or jewelry. Chester down at the bank said that Kathy came by the next day and closed out her private account. He said Jim was nervously waiting in her T-bird. I heard that they both went out west. Six months later, Sugar Daddy got him another squeeze. I think she was about 19.